Today we are talking to two people who have engaged directly with North Korea from very different perspectives, but they'll each be bringing you a window into life inside. So before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that where we stand, where we sit, where we are here today is on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people. And uh, if you would like to know in any way more about Aboriginal Melbourne, I'd advise you to take a stroll up King Street, go and visit uh, the Koori Heritage Trust, uh, or potentially even jump online and have a look at the Black GST movement. Uh, some of the topics and issues that we're going to be talking about today are directly relevant to the ongoing struggles here in Australia. So, my panellists, I would like to uh, give a very warm welcome to Anna Bronowski and Suki Kim. Please make them welcome. <laughs> So, Suki was born and raised in Seoul, in South Korea, and she's travelled in North Korea as a journalist since 2002. Her latest book, Without You There Is No Us, My Secret Life Teaching the Sons of North Korea's Elite, was published this year. Her writings appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, the New York Review of Books. She's the author of the award-winning novel The Interpreter and the recipient of Guggenheim and Fulbright Fellowships. Anna Bronowski, she fell into filmmaking by accident when she uncovered Japan's queer, bikey and otaku subcultures in the cult hit Hell Bento. She's worked as a director ever since and her films include Forbidden Lies, Aim High in Creation, Helen's War, Romancing the Chakra and Sexing the Label. They've won a huge swag of international awards. And before filmmaking, uh, she was an actor and a rock violinist. <laughs> Briefly and Briefly. a bad one. <laughs> Never. <laughs> she was born in Tokyo, grew up in the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Burma, and Iran, and the director is The Commander is her first book. So where I'm going to begin is why North Korea? Suki, the, there are a number of, there are any number of South Korean writers, journalists, who have connections and interests in, South, in North Korea. Not all of them choose to write about it. What drew you to it? Well, um... So I was born and raised in South Korea. I, I moved to America when I was 13. Um, but I was also born um, into a family that was divided by the Korean War. So uh, Korean War, which happened from 1950 to 1953, um, on both sides of my family members got lost to North Korea. So I did grow up watching my grandmother um, missing her son. Um, he was 17 at the time in 1950 when he was kidnapped into North. So um, for me, it was always a very human question of um, this war that tore apart millions of families. Um, then I ended up in America um, as a teenager. And, and in my own way, I experienced what it felt like to lose home and language and that um, what separation means, which is basically what the division of Korea is. And as a writer, I went there in 2002 for the first time. Um, I kept returning there. Uh, I went there five times through the next decade. And um, it became something of an obsession because uh, it was all lies. <laughs> it was a place of lies. And how do I begin to get to the truth of it? So seeking truth behind North Korea became a, a long, long running obsession mm -hmm. until I did go undercover there. Do you think that uh, truth as someone who is South Korean, someone who speaks the language, was more available to you than someone else? Language definitely, um, you know, because it, North Korea is just so veiled in every possible way mm. um, that uh, knowing the language absolutely um, was helpful. But I think that... You know, North Korea was so complex because uh, first off, I mean, when I first went there, it was for the 60th birthday celebration of Kim Jong-il, um, the former great leader. And I did get to experience, um, you know, whatever they decide to show you. And I think this whole theater aspect of North Korea, the propaganda and what that might mean for average citizens. And mm -hmm. from that point on also, I spent um, the next 10 years interviewing defectors, um, traveling all the surrounding area, borders of China, Laos, Thailand, Mongolia, 
um, South Korea where you find defectors and you get first-hand testimonies, and all of those were also very useful in you know, trying to understand the place. Mm -hmm. um, but that still didn't give you an answer because none of those things were verifiable, mm -hmm. um, meaning you can't really, you, you don't know if it's true or not. Mm. So, um, you know, your instinct is to believe the victims when they tell you they've been raped 40, 40 times. Mm. But how do I verify that? Um, so that was a very difficult um, thing to try to understand. I also went there to cover the New York Philharmonic concert in mm -hmm. 2008, which was another, um, basically, a theater and a bunch of basically waste of everyone's time mm. because it was just a concert. What was that? You know, it sold a lot of tickets for the New York Philharmonics which was slipping at the time as an orchestra. Um, right after that, they were back up on the fa front page of every single newspaper around the world. And um, they used North Korea for that, which was shameful. I mean, it was disgusting, I thought. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was I needed to go in there undercover. And I looked for that opportunity um, until I found it. That was in 2011 mm -hmm. when I ended up going in there and I lived there. And that's when I felt like I finally could get to it as much as I could in understanding the place. Mm -hmm. To be there, to be there on the ground. Anna, what was it that took you to North Korea in the first place? The, the, the premise behind your film is fascinating. Tell us how you came to that. Um, okay, so <laughs> I never, when I stood uh, on the de demilitarized zone from the South Korean side, when I was probably about 20 with my father, who was ambassador in South Korea at the time, looking for the elusive North Koreans through the bushes, it, it never occurred to me that one day I'd be standing on the other side. Um, what brought me there was really a birthday present that was given to me by a friend from acting school. Um, she was a producer with the ABC. This is Kim Jong-il's manifesto on how to make the perfect socialist propaganda movie. It's called The Cinema and Directing. It's part of a larger t tome that he wrote in 1973 called The Art of the Cinema. And it is so famous in North Korea, there's even a book about Kim Jong-il writing this book, where they talk about how he was such a genius that he wrote it in far greater a time than Karl Marx wrote Dust Capital, and um, I've got to say, compared to Dust Capital, this 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 makes uh, Marx look like he's an airport writer. You know, this is pretty heavy going, but. There was enough in it to fascinate me as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So um, what I was interested in was Kim Jong-il's miss mission as the dictator of a so-called last pure socialist nation on earth was to partly smash capitalism and propagandize his people and advance, uh, you know, juche socialism. Um, but what I was interested by was it was really clear that he really loved Hollywood movies. There's a kind of tension in the text between his, his hatred of America but his love of genre. And the more I, I learned about Kim Jong-il and his love of cinema and the more I read about him, the more I realized he wasn't just the punch-permed, you know, um, buffoon in Team America with the platform heels. He was a very, very clever propagandist. So I became interested in the way he used cinema to control his people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find out how did he do that? What sort of filmmaking techniques did he use? Are they different to ours? Is this a kind of, uh, you know, cinematic kryptonite? What would happen if I use these techniques in the West? Um, would it work or not? So it was a completely, um, uh, you know, it was not a, a personal connection at the beginning at all. It was completely uh, theoretical. It was as a filmmaker. Um, uh, it took me two years to get in there. And basically what I wanted to do, just cut a long story short, I wanted to make a film in Kim Jong-il's style following his rules using Western actors. I thought that that would be a crazy thing to do. I never thought I'd get inside North Korea. Um, it took me two years to get inside because what I realized was if I'm going to do this properly, I need the advice of their top propaganda filmmakers to do this. And that way, my project, which was a Kim Jong-il style propaganda movie, became a Trojan horse. And that was my way of getting inside the regime uh, twice and only a very small part of it, which was the film industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm not someone who has researched North Korea since, you know, whenever. Mm -hmm. I am someone who can speak with a small amount of authority on their film industry, full stop. And as Suki says, it is a place of lies. Mm -hmm. And as a filmmaker, I'm fascinated in how they construct those lies. Mm -hmm. 
once I got inside and tried to make a film in his style and befriended their top, their Meryl Streep, their Martin Scorsese, you know, their Oliver Stone, the, the creme de la creme of, of the North Korean propaganda film industry, I drank the Kool-Aid in a way. I fell in love with these people. I connected with them. They taught me things. Um, I felt that filmmakers are family, no matter what ideology they live under. All of these things happened because they were so generous um, in their time and their thoughts. And we'll, I'm sure you'll get us talking about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so basically that's what happened. Um, and I made a film, came back and realised that was there were so many times where my mind has said, you can't film that. Mm -hmm. And yet so many amazing things happened with my North Korean film crew that I was compelled to write a book because the book was the only way I could do justice to the world that I'd been invited inside briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. So once you are invited inside, you are no longer looking at film representations, you're face to face with people. And Suki, I'd like to ask you what kind of relationships are possible within North Korea, within that culture of lying? Um, well, I think the, the circumstances I found was um, I joined, I courted this organization, which is a international evangelical uh, Christian organization. And they had uh, been basically courting the North Korean regime for over a decade to set up a private school there. So um, they opened this uh, in 2011, was the year, where they set up this university for only the sons of North Korea's elite, young men, age 19 and 20. There were 270 of them. And um, that year, uh, which was actually the, the year that they were celebrating, North Korea, um, their calendar system is different. They, they count it from um, the birth of the original great leader. Kim Il Sang. So, so that year was the hundredth um, Juche year. Juche is self-reliance. It's Kim Il Sang's foundation philosophy for North Korea. So they will say it's a Juche year. Um, although in the rest of the world it was 2011, in North Korea it was Juche year 100. So uh, they said to celebrate that occasion, they put all the university students into construction fields. They shut down every university in the whole country for the whole year. And they put all the university students into construction fields. And they, their reason for that is um, this, this slogan they always use, which is what that means is a powerful and prosperous nation, which call, that's who they are. So to build that, all the kids are in construction field, which really was a way of scattering the youth. Because if you remember, that was the year of the Arab Spring. So they actually scatter all the college students. Um, what that also signified was that there was a political storm coming that year. Um, the only exception were 270 young men who were the sons of uh, leaders. So they didn't want to send their sons into construction fields. So these sons were basically put in this private university learning English. Um, Basically, they were hiding out the storm that's coming. Mm. Of course, by the end of that year, um, Kim Jong-il died. And Kim Jong-un, who is now the current leader, rose to power. So that power change was coming. Mm. So it did turn out that those final six months of Kim Jong-il's life, I was living with this young man. So when I got there, um, I wasn't clear who they were. It all came through uh, living with them. None of us were allowed off the campus. The boys never left. And um, we were, the teachers were taken on this group outings. But in North Korea, any group outing would have to be, it doesn't matter what they show you, it all goes back to the great leader monument. So you could be visiting a mountain, but mountain's really about all the slogans of the great leader. You're taken to an apple farm. The farm is actually about the great leader and how he built it. He didn't build it, actually. My kids built it, but they'll never tell you that. It's all the Pyongyang college students who built that apple farm. Um, 
they'll never tell you that, however. I mean, those are the things I think I did find out by talking mm -hmm. to the students. Mm -hmm. But what kind of a relationship? I mean, on surface, it looks like um, everything's fine. Um, they are adorable. They were 19. Um, they make but jokes a lot. It's, a, it's an odd thing about North Korea. They make jokes constantly. Minders will joke with you, even the kids will joke with you. But, you know, when you spend more and more time, the, another reason for doing that is because joke isn't, you can't really, you know, when you're making jokes, you're not going to be serious. And you also talk in circles. So there's a reason why um, uh, it seems very friendly, but it's actually not that friendly. You know, it takes a while where, oh, this is in order to evade having a real conversation. Um, and I think that kind of realization started coming slowly and slowly and slowly. What kind of religions are possible? Um, I think that's probably one of the saddest uh, um, things I felt about being there that I don't know if it is. I mean, I think it is. I think humanity is very much a strong thing. But in a system where you watch everyone 24-7, I thought my students were always in pairs, which looked like they were best friends. It took a while to realize it's only they're always with that particular one. And um, they, yes, they are best friends, but they're also watching each other. I mean, it's a system mm -hmm. of watching. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that kind of a realization, there were so many of them, which took time. And I think th that was only possible because I was living with them. And, and more and more, I think those realizations came, I found it kind of unbearable, actually. Um, depressing, truly depressing. And I mean, I think I have those passages in the book where I just thought, there were mornings when I just thought, you know, I can't, I can't get up here. I, I didn't want to wake up and having to face this world mm. because it was really utterly without any hope. Anna, the relationships that you formed, the filmmakers mm -hmm. that you met, the conversations you had, what was your sense of the, the possibilities of connection? Oh, um, it's really interesting listening to Suki about all of this. Um, I too noticed the humour straight away. It was one of the most surprising things to hit me within two hours of landing in Pyongyang to find myself sitting there having you know, looking at the rather disturbing sight of a banquet um, in a Swiss chalet, a fake Swiss chalet, um, where I was to sit down and then proceed to feast with and drink soju with the elite filmmakers. And this was within two hours of touching down in, in this country. Um, and within about another hour, you know, there was a, a their, their leading film director was, he'd taken his shirt off and he was drunk and he was telling anti-Soviet jokes and another one was singing in falsetto and you know there was a uh, there was a wonderful kind of uh, a, a, a humor that felt to me very Australian this kind of cutting people down but in a in a in a kind of you know taking the Mickey type type way, um, and I, I, I uh, yeah uh, uh, <laughs> no uh, I didn't know that <laughs> no mate you know we 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 never have a lens Suki never <laughs> um, but uh, yeah no it is it was a it was a it's almost a brutal humour and um, I agree that it's a coping mechanism that there are ways of talking in circles when you're you're being funny but it's also um, a survival mechanism. Um, you know, if you can laugh at something, it, it doesn't hurt, hurt as much. Mm. And uh, on, in that first banquet, I made a friendship that has stayed with me to this day. I went to North Korea twice, and the second time I went, he and I basically spent almost every day there of the three, three and a half week shoot that I was on um, together. And that was because he spoke Japanese. So that was um, Pak song Zhu, who's uh, one of Kim Jong-il's favorite film directors, known for his pro-atom bomb thrillers, A Country I Saw, part one and part two. Um, but in person, he was this gentle, 
uh, incredibly sensitive, very perceptive man um, who used to speak to me in a kind of flirtatious Japanese and, uh, y y you know, with, with kind of sayings in Japanese, like women are like cigarette smoke, you know, you try to touch them, they disappear. And, and you know, it was, it was incorrigible. He was like 20 years older than me, but he basically took me under his wing like a Taekwondo master might take on a particularly troubling student mm. and tried to teach me his method of filmmaking. Uh, North Korea still makes films on celluloid. It's a very nostalgic approach. They shoot um, on old German Ari cameras, no sync sound. So think Italian B-movies from the 70s. Um, everything's post-dubbed. Uh, one thing that North Korean filmmakers have that even Jerry Bruckheimer would envy is um, complete access to the military arsenal. So if you want to blow things up, you know, and also the North Korean actors do their own stunts. So that was pretty interesting coming back and telling Peter O'Brien and people like that. And guess what? You actually have to do your own stunt. That's, that's the North Korean style. Um, thousands of extras they have access to, of course. Um, but... Yeah, that it was nostalgic. He he took me around, he showed me his world much more so than I ever thought I would see, including one of them, his colleague, said, All right, you're you're in my movie. And I said, What? And he said, Yeah, you're gonna play an evil American. So he wrote me a part in his military thriller that he was shooting on the US Pueblo, which is a battleship that the North Koreans captured in 1968, that now floats in the river in the middle of Pyongyang as a kind of floating trophy, proof of their military supremacy. And um, I have a wonderful clip, actually. I'd love to show you it. But the director, who was like their Oliver Stone, you know, gold chains, he was the guy telling the Soviet jokes. He um, he said, my film is about how the American bastards, you know, they left their ship here, we got it, and we won. That's the end of the story. Um, it was obviously a propaganda film. Every film they make is a propaganda film. That What interested me is that they make rom-coms, they make monster movies, they make historical melodramas, they make uh, dra dramatic romances, you know, bodice rippers. So the genre types uh, far and wide, thanks to Kim Jong-il and the way he revolutionized the film industry, but the messages are very, very restricted. Anyway, there I was, with, I suddenly found myself with Joan Collins' hair, you know, looking like someone out of Dynasty 1982, in a white jumpsuit in a bowling alley in the underfloor of the Young Gakdo Hotel with a picture of Lady Di on the wall, and I had to bowl and then go, yeah. And what, what was <laughs> the person I was saying yeah to was my American husband. Now, this was a bit of a scoop if you're into North Korean cinema. Um, they were the sons. There were three of them. They were six foot tall. They had blue eyes and they, they were blonde, right? They were North Korean born and bred. They could barely speak English. They looked at me like I was the devil incarnate and personally responsible for the millions killed in the Korean War. Um, and I had to pretend I was in love with these guys. Who were they? They were the sons of Joe Dresnok, who was a GI who defected over into North Korea in the 60s, hoping to make it to Russia. He never got there because Kim Jong-il said, I'll have you, thank you very much. Put him as the bad guy in every single film he made. And Joe Dresnok became number one bad guy, very famous. And his sons were carrying on the tradition, whether they liked it or not. Anyway, suffice to say, I got sacked after three takes because I kept looking down the barrel and I couldn't crack it. I was too nervous and I felt like I'd let down my country. But um, what I discovered with Pak song Zhu, and I'm still thinking about what he was trying to tell me, and there were many conversations we had that were, as Suki was pointing out, lateral and almost metaphorical. But, but it was clear to me that Pak knew a lot more than he was going to let on, that if I had asked him point blank anything that was really on my mind, it would have got him in trouble as well as me. And so we talked laterally. Um, J Japanese was perfect because they had a mind of watching them, just as I had a mind of watching me, at least two. So Park and I flirted, we used humor. And on the last day that we were together, he finally came close to what I felt was letting down his guard. He was talking in Japanese to Mr. Orr, the cinematographer. It was back at the Swiss chalet. And they were saying, 
in Japanese. She has no idea what really happens in our country, does she? And I was, you know, drinking the soju and I thought, why not? What have I got to lose? They, you know, I'm going back anyway. I said, that's right. All we hear about is your gulags. Now, that was complete, you know, taboo. I shouldn't have even said that word. Um, but I had nothing to lose. And Puck didn't miss a beat. He didn't look at me like I'd said something wrong. He looked at me like... Yes, you know as well, of course, and I know you know. And his mind at the time was very drunk at the end of the table, just clapping to some beat in his mind and not listening. And Puck said, you know, there's a seismic shift coming in our country, Anna, and you can take that back with you and tell the world. Things used to be better for us. They're not anymore. At which point, Kim Jong-il's favourite composer, Pei Yong Sam, who had won the North Korean equivalent of an Oscar, which is People's Artist, mm. said, don't say that, don't say that. Right. Her government has spent lots of money sending her here. They'll lose face. And Park just kept going. He just said, you know, let's drink to another time. Um, he and I cried when we said goodbye. And I keep thinking about things he shared with me, which is one of the reasons I had to write the book, because I had to understand what was really happening anyway. Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, Suki, you had a moment that what Anna has just told us about crying upon departure and when you've got nothing left to lose. And I'm thinking here of when you left after the New York Philharmonic tour with your mind, you stood on the tarmac and you spoke your mind. And that's one of the most powerful sections in the book. Can you tell us what happened there? Um, this is the Philharmonic time. I believe so, when but then from there, the I guess I'm interested in those moments when the facade slips. Um, I'm not sure if the facade slipped. Okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, there was a moment after, the Philharmonic was a very, um, it was a, um, a horrible event actually. Um, I felt really dirty for having been a part of it. I went to cover that for Harper's Magazine, and um, about 100 uh, reporters came in. I don't know if Australia covered it, but basically every country in the world covered it. And uh, Philharmonic made, New York Philharmonic made some deal with, uh, uh, I guess, the US government and the um, North Korean government to go and play Vorjak in Pyongyang and um, that this was going to be some sort of a symbol of music, using music for um, some peace thing. But that's all it was. It was just a concert. And um, patrons of New York Philharmonic were shipped in, and they all paid something like $50,000 per person or something. Uh, there's a lot of money involved in this one. And um, basically, the... The concert hall was filled with uh, the elite, and um, you know they behaved perfectly well. And there was Lauren Mazel, who's now passed away, famous conductor, saying 70 million Koreans will thank me forever because he single-handedly now brought peace to the Korean Peninsula. He's good. <laughs> and um, but because you know that what is very disgusting about that event was that if all those top newspapers and TV stations around the world spend a lot of money sending their top journalists. It was not an arts reporter who went there. It's usually their like political, you know, um, hot journalists went. They couldn't really come back and say there was no story. It's a, it's a nature of capitalism. You invest a lot of money into a story, you're not going to say nothing happened. So it became this headline. CNN, New York Times began saying, you know, the audience members were crying. <laughs> they were so, you know, why would uh, they play the American anthem and also North Korean anthem? You know, that's actually not even, North Korean anthem is not really North Korean anthem. It's a North Korean anthem, but the song, the real song that is an anthem in that country is the song of Kim Jong-il, um, which is not what they played. So it was basically all a theater. And, um, and we were all supposed to leave because journalists, it was such a perfect manipulation of, by the regime to use journalists for what they wanted. Because now, every journalist can only report on what they saw. And Pyongyang looked fantastic because you know, it was all done up. 
and, um, and that's what the photographers uh, photographed. And that, those are the stories that went out. How and long ago this, was this? This was 2008. Yeah, because there have been a lot of stories since then that acknowledge the cracks behind the facade. Well, this was a 2008 story. Yeah, and uh, yeah, sure, yeah. So, but th so that whole uh, propaganda was actually um, literally on the cover of every newspaper in the world. And once CNN, New York Times say, music was brought to North Korea, um, then, you know, everybody else wrote the same story. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, nobody was talking about what was really going on in that country, because that's not what the journalists got to see. Can I dive in, though? Because since then, CNN, Fox, New York Times, Washington Post, Huffington Post, you name it, are running the story the story of the gulags, the starvation, the brainwashing. No, 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 so they, they quite a lot, quite, no. you know, the no, same run, outlets. No. Hold on. They yeah. run them anyway, but this particular event got every single newspaper and the TV network. Yeah, attention. as the did the time. Sony hack. And At the, the same Sony, time, right. Sure, and, and what's interesting is the Sony hack got the same outlets, and yet the Sony hack, since then, it is debatable whether the North Korean even, even did it. In fact, North Security is suggesting North Korea didn't hack Sony. Uh -huh. So I guess what I'm, what I'm interested in is, is, you know, there is a North Korean story. Uh, I love what you were saying about capitalism and capitalism follows the story. And you've got to make money out of it if you've invested in it. I feel that there's a whole parallel universe called North Korea Inc., which runs stories that don't kind of get put up against the same kind of journalistic scrutiny that you put to your stuff, you, co you corroborate. But a lot of journalists don't about when it comes to North Korea. It's almost fair game. You know, in the last year, I've counted five mainstream stories that have been disseminated by all the outlets you've just mentioned, all of which were since proven to be false about North Korea. What so kind of this, stories were they? Oh, everything from Kim Jong-il has poisoned his aunt, and she was recently, it was acknowledged in a blog originally in South Korea that no, she was spotted alive and apparently well, who knows, in Pyongyang. Um, that Kim Jong-il executed tra a traffic lady for sneezing, which was um, uh, traced back to um, a UK sat satirist blog on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, that Kim Jong-il executed his uncle. We know he did. Of course he did. But with 50 starving Manchurian dogs, which was traced back to a Chinese satirist on Tencent Weibo. Um, you know, it, it goes on and on. These stories... Oh, the Sony hack, of course. These stories are almost grabbed because it's fair game. You know, let's. I mean, is this, is gonna this is going to sell. This is going to get eyeballs. No, sure, well, but no, no, if I can just finish what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me it's not just, you know, people who are shills for the regime or, or people who are even wet liberals or cultural hum humanitarians or, or whatever who feel this is a problem. It's people like Bill Richardson, the, the former governor of New Mexico, who says if we keep this culture going of false reporting about North Korea... It's not going to help us understand a very dangerous regime. And so I think that the media needs to be very much more um, disciplined mm. when it comes to reporting North Korea and much less uh, tending to go for, yes, the New York Philharmonic on one, it, on one level mm. or, or let's make fun of them on the mm. other. Well, I think that's where the length of book, the, the style of work, the long form, the ability to go deep, to research, to write over a long period, that's where you're actually answering back to that daily news churn. Yeah. And a book like yours, I mean, when you set out to I write I mean, the fact that basically there's just not so much, you know, journalism has failed when it comes to North Korea, and there's mm. nothing new about that. Mm. That's Solomonic what I was trying to say. Was, yeah, yeah. Solomonic <laughs> was a very good example, mm. but in that case, it was the North Korean government mm -hmm. manipulating all of that. Mm -hmm. mm aided by the New York Philharmonic, um, um, who did, you know, sell a lot of their, uh, um, their concerts sold out since then. Mm. Um, so 
the fact that journalism has failed, there's nothing new about that. I mean, I, I went to cover actually the um, was the World Cup when the New York New North Korean team qualified for the first time in 44 years, and that was in Johannesburg. So when I went there to cover it, um, CNN was reporting that Kim Jong Il had hired a thousand Chinese actors to pose as fans. Because as you can imagine, there are no North Korean fans mm. in the <laughs> stadium. You know, they were fighting Portugal. There was all Portuguese. There was no, you know, there's no accidental North Korean tourist who's gonna. <laughs> so CNN thought it was like really funny, you know, and um, you know I was there. And I did go talk to those people. There were some North Koreans. There were about 50 of them, 70 of them. And they were actually workers that they shipped in um, from Namibia. Uh, they were definitely North Korean. They were not Chinese. Um, so somehow, they didn't say that. CNN didn't say it. They said there were 1,000 Chinese actors. So because it made a funny, I don't know who came up with it. Like mm. somebody probably thought, you know, that it would be funny. It gets more eyeballs, mm. you know? Well, I mean, then they what sell, they want to read. Right. So journalism hasn't worked. No. At all. So which is why um, I, I went undercover, <laughs> you know, mm. pretending to be a missionary, uh, evangelical missionary. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a missionary. And I'm not, I'm not Christian, and I, I have no religion. So, and also a teacher, which I also was not. So, um, I went in posing as one, and I stayed in the school, um, which really was a prison. Because I mean, you know, what kind of a school is guarded by the military, and you also can never leave. Mm. So, uh, and so I was in there um, from, I guess, those final six months. And I wasn't interviewing my students. I was living with them. And it was not from anything they told me that I guess whatever I realized about their world came. It was really, I think, through our living. And those tiny slips they made or the way they were. Mm. And it was in moments when what their world really was, became more and more and more. And it would come very subtly. People would say, like, did you ask them? No, you, if you ask them, you never get an answer. Mm. Or they'd but, send you out as well. Well, you yeah. couldn't really because you're being watched 24-7. Mm. But it was more in um, little things like I would assign essay writing as a school teacher. I mean, university was a college teacher. And they couldn't do it, you know? Smartest kids in North Korea, supposedly. Well, their, their fathers are very powerful, but they were mm. also incredibly bright. It was impossible to teach essay writing. And at first, I was like, you know, I guess, you know, they're having a hard time. But no, it was like they couldn't come up with any of it. Introduction, thesis, um, it, it just didn't work. And more and more, I realized, oh, they don't know what, uh, they don't know what introduction is. Mm. And they can't, the concept doesn't exist. And when you look at North Korean newspaper, Nodong Shimun, you'll see the tone is the same from beginning till the end because God doesn't need, I mean, it's, it's, it's a North Korean God, doesn't need introduction. Mm. There's something about pacing is the same, tone is the same. You don't do things like introduction. This and sentence didn't exist. You don't evidence. need supporting details. You don't you need don't supporting need details and you don't need conclusion. So the things you take for granted just didn't work. What it meant was a critical thinking. Mm. And the quality of critical thinking did not exist in this country. And that was really heartbreaking. I, I found it, yeah, I, I found a slightly different thing because I was dealing with filmmakers who were allowed a little bit more access. Although the sons of the elite, I imagine, had seen some outside culture, do you think? Some access? There were 19 and 20. Yeah. And um, this access, you know, I get asked that questions all the time. How much did they know? How much did they not know? Yeah. If they did know, they were certainly not going to show that because you're not supposed to say that. Yeah. If they did know, it was so random and snippets. Mm. Yeah, 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 so yeah. It's like having people thought if they saw New York Philharmonic concert and saw Vorjak, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were like finally I see music and you. So I mean, that's not the way it was. You know, my kids would bright, bright, and then mm. they'll say something like, "Basketball makes us grow tall." Mm. They've been taught that in their science class. Yeah. 
But what that one thing, if they say 100% they believed it because that's what they've been taught. What that also means is that there were many other things like that they got taught, which mm. is basically nonsense, mm. right? Yeah. Or, but then they might have seen one thing and that one thing, it doesn't compute basically, you know? Like they thought there were so many things that they would say that made, you know, absolutely no sense. Like scientists who think like, you know, we can change blood type A to blood type B. And it's like, come on, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, no, but that's what they've been taught. Mm. So I think more and more what scared me mo most, and it's not this whole robot great leaders, great stuff, which they do, like this whole propaganda. It was more that, is it possible to teach things like geography, um, literature, um, science, computer, without mentioning the rest of the world. I, I Their think, education yeah. does not mention it. Mm. Uh, uh, my experience was with the people who are given access and allowed to teach, uh, allowed to think in a way that your students were not. So I was dealing with a very small pocket of propagandists mm -hmm. who are given access to outside movies, outside directors, even newspapers, in order to study how the West works and to co-opt our techniques to then manipulate the North Korean population. So the people I was dealing with were critical thinkers. Um, the filmmakers were at least. Mm. And it was quite interesting to me, however, that the access was limited. So when I said, what filmmakers have you heard of? They'd heard of James Cameron, which is not a surprise because he's the most socialist filmmaker Hollywood's ever pro you know, produced, really, if you look at Avatar. Um, uh, Godfather, um, you know, uh, Hitchcock, which, who they you know, admitted was probably the best horror filmmaker in the world for them. Um, but they'd never heard of Tarantino. They'd never heard of Stanley Kubrick, which I thought was interesting because his films deal with imprisonment, insanity, um, and systems that you can't get mm. out of. But the stark contrast for me, um, to pick up on uh, it, 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 the little glimmers of complete lack of knowledge and complete isolation, I think comes back to me, for me to the fact that North Korea has no access to the internet. And if you think about that, that's huge. That is massive. That means that they can be propagandized because they have no access to anything other than the films that Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un or the regime decide to show them the two channels in Pyongyang, mm. the one outside. And we started to, Nicola and I, my camerawoman, on this shoot, started to look for the lost, lost in translation moments, the moments where the cracks would show and the isolation would become apparent. And then we started to work with that. Mm. So one of them was, I snuck in um, a video that I cut together in Sydney um, of Australian protesters, people who live in Oskenville, farmers fighting against coal seam gas, happy families on beaches, because I knew, knew these images are not what they see of the West. And I opened up this very laptop and I had to teach them how to press the mouse. And they all affected to be bored by this Western gadget, but you could see they were fascinated. And they watched this video and it was my way of saying, look, that's the West as well. That's not what you're told. Um, the lost in translation, the glimmers, we had a lovely young interpreter called Kim, who was about 22. She looked like a K-pop loving girl from Seoul, purple mascara, tight skinny jeans, and yes, girls can wear jeans in North Korea. Um, uh, and uh, it was a hot day, we're driving around, and I took out this bottle of Kim Kardashian perfume that someone had given me as a joke for getting into the most anti-capitalist nation on earth. And, um, you know, gave myself squirt, and she grabbed the bottle from me and said, oh, you have a perfume named after our dear leader. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's when it, you know, she's 22. How do you begin to explain reality TV and the Kardash Kardashians? Mm. Um, but the, the, so that's what, Nicola and I took it upon ourselves to, to subtly re-educate her in the time we had her. And by the third week, we're driving outside Pyongyang to the apple and turtle farm that Suki's students built. 
where they tell the kids to drink ground up turtle brain because it'll help them in their exams. And she had started to confide in us. She was young enough not to be controlled yet. And she, when the camera wasn't rolling, she wanted to know. And I'll never forget one day she said, what is rent? What is mortgage? What does a producer do? None of which they are familiar with. But she said, what can we do about the problem of gay people? And, you know, this was, this was our opportunity to then tell her all about Mardi Gras, you know, equal marriage, gay families, you name it. And mm. that was too much. Mm. That was too much. Too much. Um, we're going to go to audience questions in one second. So please get your questions ready. Keep them brief. Keep them pr uh, concise. Uh, but just before we do that, Suki, I wanted to ask, when you were there as a teacher, you were... You're there as a writer, you're taking notes, you're absorbing every single detail from the world around you. But the sense that I got from your book is that the students were also absorbing every single detail from you. They were, they were watching and they were, there was curiosity bubbling beneath the surface. And in the assignments you set them, in the, you know, the, the end of term film that you choose to show them, what were the decisions that you were making around what kinds of aspects of your culture that you were trying to show them? Well, I mean, I think it was always a, um, a mixed uh, dilemma uh, on a daily basis mm. because um, I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to tell them anything, you know. I mean, they didn't even know what the internet was and they were the um, students of science and technology. And um, I couldn't... I knew we were being watched 24-7 because I was told that. Also, they were making reports on me. So if I said anything, they would also report. Mm. Um, I would be in trouble. But it was always because the students were never allowed to be one-on-one -on -one with me. It was me and three students eating or me. And um, always when they came to my office, it's two students. And what that means is one is reporting on the other one. So there was just no way that, but you know, of course you want to say, you want to tell them. So I, I, I used the group, the lesson in a classroom to, if it was something about college education, then I dropped things like Mark Zuckerberg in the lesson and hoping that they would get it. They would get there's something else that they don't know. Steve Jobs, I kept mentioning for no reason, but related to the lesson mm. and, um, but it was, even when I did stuff like that, um, without, I think the one lesson I did was I kept, that Steve Jobs died, actually, um, while I was there. And one lesson, uh, I, made a obit I made a big deal about, I did get it approved, because we had to get everything approved, that I needed to teach them how to write obituary. <laughs> but it was a biography. I was like, so in order to do that, we, of course, we used Steve Jobs' obituary. And um, that was me trying to tell them something about, you guys are computer majors. And there's this guy who invented this computer I'm holding in front of you. Um, but then when I did that, they all changed their essay topics the next lesson. And suddenly, all their lessons became about ills of America. It was yeah. about American death penalty, mm -hmm. American divorce, which causes mental illness, American fast food, McDonald's, which is evil, but they didn't know McDonald's was hamburger. Um, so, you know, it was a reaction where suddenly somebody told them, you know, you're not supposed to do this. Basically, it was a warning to me, like, mm. do, not, do not do this anymore. Mm. So, but whenever that kind of stuff happened, it was like, like this walking on tightrope or something, because I was so afraid. Like, it was so hard to go to sleep because mm. then would the student get in trouble or if they, but then it would be like if they learn there's something more and they're stuck there and how unhappy would they be in their mm. lives for the rest of their lives and they really felt like my kids more and more and, and I'm gonna leave them and the kind of lives they would have, you know, it was so depressing and I would stay up like, I just, I had such an insomnia, I couldn't sleep and I would worry. It was just this dark weight worrying, and it was horrible. And I remember thinking, 
I don't want, I just, it just was a horrible, horrible place to be. Also, another feeling I would get would be, also, I didn't trust them either. And that's a, it's, a, it's just such a sick feeling to not trust your own kids. Because I love them too, but I also didn't trust them because their job is to report on me. And so this complicated thing, and I think this is how I felt about North Korea. So the things that I'm telling you right now, all this mix of feelings, um, and that got worse and worse as I loved them more and I understood them more. Another thing, they lied all the time. Mm. My lovely kids also, mm. they lied at the drop of a hat. The biggest liars in the world. And, but their system was also about lies. Um, so, but I also understood why they were lying. At first it was like, why are they lying all the time? Are they crazy? But then like, I realized, oh, they've never even been taught what's lie and what's not lies. And, and I kind of took became their side, like, you know, like their mom. I was mm. like, I know where they're lying. And so what I mean is it's basically, you're like, constantly, your mind is going all the time, this mind game. And I was so tired of the mind game. And I felt like, this is what this world is, you know? Like the greatest humanity of this beautiful young men, their system was all about like the most inhumane system because it was about squashing that humanity in every possible way so that they loved me, but they also didn't trust me. You know, on my last day, one of the last <coughs> things I said to them was, what do you want? I'm leaving. And can you tell me one thing that you want? Because I, I was like, I'll, you know, I'll do anything for you. One thing. And they said, can you talk to us in Korean? And I was an English teacher. I wasn't allowed to speak Korean to them. They just wanted to hear me talk to them, address them in, mm. in like our mutual language, Korean. And I realized, it was like so like, I was like, oh, this is like their way of saying, we love you, you know? And I was like, so this, this is so much of this real humanity, but you know, but their world is opposite that, totally the opposite that. And I think that, was the feeling of being there. When I mm. say it was so depressing, it was mm -hmm. so hopeless, it was because it was so inhumane. 